Good morning, XJWs. This is the Oracle coming in for another edition of my vlog. Today, I'm going to be doing something a little bit different. As most of you know, I have been doing videos for about a year and a half. And my focus has been on the SJW community and how it has been impacted by all of the XJWs that are telling their experiences. But today, I wanted to do something a little bit different. I wanted to do something specifically about my personal experience. In my personal experience in the Jehovah Witness organization and, and the ex-Jehovah Witness organization is one of being a person of African descent, of being an African American in the United States. Today, my topic is how the Jehovah Witness organization failed the African American community. I am going to give you a little bit of an introduction and I want to talk a little bit about the format of this discussion and then we're going to get right into it. There are a few ex Jehovah Witnesses that have talked a little bit about the African American experience as far as being a Jehovah Witness, but I have not seen any YouTube videos that have specifically talked about African-Americans, the African-American community, and the relationship with the Jehovah Witness organization. And this is something that is near and dear to my heart because I am an African-American. And I want to say not to take a dig at anyone else that has talked about the racial inequalities of the Jehovah Witness Organization in the United States. But for me, when I hear about different people that have been affected by the Jehovah Witness Organization and they're talking about a specific community or a specific ethnicity, I literally want to hear that from the people that are in that community and of that ethnicity. It's not a dig, but I'm speaking truth. So I am very, very happy. I'm very proud to come from the African-American community. I am very proud of my ethnicity. I have studied it, meaning I've studied African-American studies. I have written on the African-American experience at a university setting. Um, I have a graduate degree. I also have a few graduate certificates. Um, so I have written research about the African-American experience and the African experience as it pertains to the Americas. I have done research that has been published. Um, I did this in my undergrad when I was in my last year of school and I was trying to learn more about my heritage and I was friends with quite a few of the professors and I did some independent study that was more of a journalism African-American studies uh, hybrid, and I was able to do some research and, and get permission to go to some institutes in my city that I was a part of and learn some, some very interesting things. At this time, I want to thank my husband. Uh, hello. Um, because when I, when I talked to my husband about actually talking about the African-American experience and talking about the African-American experience and the Jehovah Witness organization. I actually went to my husband who's an educator and who has done fellowships on the African-American experience. He has a master's degree in education, um, has written extensively about this. So one thing that he did was he actually got some research for me so that I could include it in uh, my presentation. So I just want to say thank you, honey. Oh, you are most, you are most welcome, my dear. And um, and he is a, an award-winning educator. So it's important if you saw a library of the African American 
um, in African studies that we have in our in our library and in our lives. Um, this was very important to me. If you see where the camera is pointing, it is an African statue that we got. Where is it from? Ghana or is the Ghana? Okay. So um, you know, I remember one time when I was doing a video. Um, someone asked me about the actual statue that I focused the camera on and asked me was it was it significant in terms of voodoo or something like that. And I didn't get offended because I understand that there's a lot of miseducation when it comes to the African American and African experience and especially in the Jehovah Witness organization. So when you see a sculpture that has an African face on it, it doesn't mean that they're actually talking about something that has to do with voodoo or worshiping evil spirits or anything like that. The same way that you can look at a Greek statue and see a Greek bust and a Roman statue and see a Roman bust, you're not going to automatically think that this is about some type of voodoo or conjuring up spirits, but we've been conditioned to look at African masks and African statues and busts of Africans and automatically assume something negative. So I wanted to kind of talk about the mindset behind that, um, but I wanted to also kind of clarify the education behind myself, my husband who's actually helped me with this. Thank you, sweetie. Oh, you are most welcome. Of all of our studies, history is best qualified to reward our research. That's Brother Malcolm. Thank you. So um, I also want to talk about my experience because I've actually been around African-American studies for quite a long time. My stepfather, although he married my mother when I was eight years old, and I am a third generation African-American that was born into the organization, my stepfather was actually a convert. So he actually comes from historically black college and university where he went and got his undergrad. Um, he went to a, a normal university and got his master's, but he also taught African-American history before teaching in the actual uh, school districts that I was a part of. His brother, he has two brothers that have PhDs in African-American studies and history and were professors at historically black colleges and universities. For people that are not United States or people that are not familiar with the HBCU, what that means, it means historically black colleges and universities. So my stepfathers, um, two of his brothers were professors with PhDs that actually taught African American studies. So when my stepfather married my mother, he had a huge library of a lot of books and a lot of research that I was able to read and learn about. Um, you know, it's, it's really interesting now that I'm very reflective and I've got, gotten over the anger and the dysfunction of my life. And I can honestly say that my stepfather had a lot to do with my educational aspirations and going to some of the top schools in the country that I mentioned, if you ever listen to any of my other videos where I talk a little bit about going to the top school in the state when I was in the fifth grade with my brother and actually reading and doing math at a 12th grade level in the fifth grade. And those are all things that my stepfather was very instrumental in making us do math, learn math, learn about education, um, take our education very serious, even though even before my mother married my stepfather, my brother and I were always very, very, um, we were very, very much into reading and, and learning about ourselves and learning about who we are. So I wanted to kind of give that background on why I wanted to talk specifically about the African American experience in the United States, but more specifically, I wanted to talk about the African American experience and the Jehovah Witness religion. The last part and the most important part, my catalyst for ever doing any of this, is that years and years ago, before I ever came across any YouTube channels that were ex Jehovah Witness, I was taking a graduate course in world religion. 
And as part of the research for that world religion graduate course, I was looking in a journal for something completely unrelated. And I came across a journal article that an African-American man had done where he talked about the Jehovah Witness organization and how it had affected him as an African-American. He had a PhD. And what really, and of course, as soon as I read it, being an ex Jehovah Witness and being a person of African-American descent predominantly, I was so interested to read this article. And what really touched me more than anything else was his documentation of the Jehovah Witness organization going after African-Americans. I, I was so floored by their, their teaching on African-Americans being you know, cursed and things that I had heard about in my own life, but seeing the research and the documentation and the annotations behind it totally blew my mind. I was, I, I was so just knocked down by the, the things that I was reading in this journal article, and I shared it with anyone that I could about, listen, this organization has treated African Americans as second class citizens for a good portion of the foundation of this inception of the organization, and it has taught that African Americans were cursed, and it has implemented rules that even though they've gotten rid of a lot of that teaching, is covertly still there. And most importantly, they went after African-American people because their, their idea was they can use the African-American population to help grow their numbers, but also to go after uneducated people, people that were very disgruntled with the way that society was treat, treating them and offer them the status of being seen as equal and and give them this false idea of an equalitarian society when they were in the Jehovah Witness organization. So today, I'm gonna to go deep. If you're not interested in African-American community or African-American study or African study, I can honestly say you probably will not enjoy this video. I am actually not going to mince my words. I actually have the research here and again that's one of the reasons that I, I asked my husband to come in at the beginning, and I wanted to thank him for all of the research that he actually put together for me in order for me to reference it. Because what you're going to see in my presentation is that this, not just Jehovah Witness organization, but this country has gone out of this way to miseducate African-American people and then use that miseducation as a way to exploit them. And it's not just done it with African-American people, but minorities, and I hate to use the word minority because we're actually not a minority in the world, but in the United States, this idea that certain people are minor, the way that they can go around and you know conditioning people to be subservient and to believe that you are you're just happy to be in the same room with the group of people that's actually discriminated against you that you kind of lose sight of the fact that they're still controlling the room and that's my point is that i want to talk about how this organization has actually been detrimental to Jehovah Witnesses of African American descent, but also the, the populations of people that they've historically gone after. And I see it even to this day, and I've said it many times in my videos, that the Jehovah Witness organization is a majority non-white organization. And I'm gonna cite the statistics for even the Jehovah Witnesses in the United States because it's predominantly non-white. But you don't see that, not only is it predominantly non-white, it's predominantly female. But you don't see that in the Jehovah Witnesses that are actually presented to the media. And even in the ex-Jehovah Witness community, I don't see a lot of the reflection of the true numbers of the population of Jehovah Witnesses. And I don't think it's the fault of the ex-Jehovah Witness community. I think it's really about the digital divide and I think it's about access and I think it's about 
actually wanted to do it, but I feel like we need to have an honest conversation about how the failure has affected so many non-white Jehovah Witnesses. Uh, you know, there's all Spanish congregations, there's all Chinese American um, congregations. There are there's just so many groups of people that that have given this organization its numbers, but you don't see that reflected when people are actually talking about it for or against. And, and the women, it's like there are so many women that are actually Jehovah Witnesses. It's a, actually a female dominated by numbers organization, but you don't see that. You don't see that when you see who's actually, who's the face of this, who's the face of that. So I don't want to get too far in the weeds. I want to kind of set up how I'm actually going to do my, my topic today. So the first part of my topic, because we finished the introduction, is I want to do a background of African Americans in the United States. And because I know that there are people that watch my video that are not in the United States, um, because again, the, 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 the biggest part of the Jehovah Witnesses, even though it has started in the United States, is non-Americans. <laughs> So there's a lot of people that are going to look at this topic and be interested in it from a, a place of let me hear about this group of people and how it has affected them. So I really don't feel like I can talk about the African American experience and the Jehovah Witnesses unless I do a background on the African American experience in the United States. So I, I want to start with the background of the African American experience in the United States and my, my husband who is an educator. Um, who has done fellowships and has published things on the African American African American experience and the African passage to the United States is the one who helped me with this research and one of the reasons I asked him to just come on and so I could give him things on you know behind the camera. If by the way, if you're curious why I don't show my face, please go to my first video called uh, My Awakening. And I give a very good background on why I was motivated to start doing videos and uh, why I don't show my face. The next part, and I think the most important part for people that are ex Jehovah Witnesses, is I want to talk about the background of African Americans and the Jehovah Witness organization. I'm going to cite everything, and I'm actually going to put, once I finish doing the video, I'm actually going to link all of the journal articles that I am referencing. There is one major journal article that I am going to get most of my information from, but there are other journal articles that have been cited in this article, and I want people to look at for further reading. Because again, um, the, biggest, the biggest meat or theme that I want people to understand is that the way that people are exploited, and this is every Jehovah Witness, regardless of their background, is that they want to miseducate you or deny you higher education or research so that they can they can exploit you. You know, and that's a constant theme in the United States: denial of education, denial of people's right to control their ideas and thoughts about the world around them and they can supplement it so that they can control you. And so that's why I think it's very important that I cite everything that I'm talking about because I want people to know that there is a lot of research out there. Find out for yourself. The third part is I'm gonna kind of tie it together with my own personal observations and experiences. So this is not me going out and researching about what it's like to be a Chinese American in the Jehovah's Witness organization. This is me actually having lived it. It's a part of my legacy. It's a part of the oral traditions of my family that has been passed down for centuries. I can talk about it because I've lived it. Not only have I lived it, I've published research. The research that I'm talking about is research that I've actually gotten from my husband and I have books and articles that my stepfather has given me even though he I was this fellowship 
And it's really funny because I was in fellowship, but the last few times I talked to my stepfather before I moved, um, my stepfather actually gave me two books. He gave me a book by John Hope Franklin, which is from Slavery to Freedom. And if anyone is interested in African American studies, if you want to kind of get a very good book on the core, the core sort of historical experience of African Americans, the John Hope Franklin from Slavery to Freedom is a very great book to get. Having studied this at the university and graduate level, um, we have that in our library. Um, another book that he gave me was the Booker T. Washington, Booker T. Washington versus W. E. Du Bois, um, talking about the difference between African Americans getting learning a trade versus going to college. So um, these are things that I've actually read from cover to cover. Um, my husband is actually taught, um, like I said, and won awards for this. But if you see our if you see our library. Um, you see things like the classic maze, uh, classic slave narratives up from slavery, introduction to African civilization, the Africana um, by Gates, and uh, I can't say the first name of that, but we, we just have a lot of education on that. But, you know, that's all theoretical. We actually have firsthand accounts from our families and our historical um, our historical knowledge. And I wanna kinda of tie it together after I get back past the first two parts to talk about it from what I've learned from my own family, being not just African-American, but African-American and the Jehovah Witness organization. And then I'm gonna tie it all together and I'm gonna to prove to you the failures, how the Jehovah Witness organization has failed the African-American community. And I want to talk about the different ways and I've documented and I wrote it down. There are five ways that I have made my conclusion that the Jehovah Witness organization has specifically harmed the African-American community. And then I'm going to talk about what, what is the real purpose of this? What is my goal in having this, this actual, actual presentation? And again, I hope you enjoy it. Um, if you have comments, if you want more research, um, please feel free to write me. I'm, I'm you know, a very transparent in terms of I will respond to you. I'm sometimes very, very busy, but I really do try to reach out to people um, and give and point them in the right direction. Another thing that I also want to point out and I want to like tell people um, is that if you are really interested in the African-American passage or the African-American experience, I will encourage you to visit Washington, D.C. and go to the African-American Museum. I'm also going to link that in my video. If you are interested, it is a phenomenal, phenomenal place to go. And it really has a great start from the beginning all the way to where we are today. Um, start in the basement because the basement actually starts with where Africans came from different parts of West Africa and how they actually came here. Um, I also want to mention that one of my stepfather's uh, brothers, who would be, I guess, a step uncle, actually spent time living in Ghana and, and published some research there and actually taught at a university. So these are things that I was all brought up with and learned about, which is probably not going to be a traditional African-American, especially in the Jehovah Witness organization. So again, thank you so much for joining me. I hope you learned something. I hope that you get something from it. If anything, I hope that it makes you think. So uh, segueing the African-American Museum and when it talks about where we came from. And who are we? And again, I'm not going to do a two hour presentation on just that. I'm going to try and keep it high level, but I do want to hit on some things. So I've also stated some of the research that I'm getting this from classic saved narratives. Um, I'm getting this from John Hope Franklin from Slavery to Freedom. I'm getting that from Introduction to African Civilizations. 
I'm getting this from Faces at the Bottom of the Well by Gary Bell. So um, there's quite a few books that I'm actually going to link to this. Um, another one is Race and Manifest Destiny. I do actually want to mention that a lot of African Americans that are in the United States also have Native American background. I am no different. Um, my family has land in Alabama that was given to us by the government. Um, one part of my family um, is, uh, if, you, if you want to do some research on the Cherokee and the African American experience, there's a lot of research out there. So a lot of African Americans, a lot of Africans when they first came to the United States were in areas where there were all, you know, Native Americans, this is their land. So um, a lot of us live around them. Some of, some of the Native Americans actually enslaved Africans along with the white settlers that were here that were massacring the Native Americans and pushing them further and further from their land. Um, if you wanna learn more about the Native American massacres and genocide, um, start at Trail of Tears um, and learn about the different groups that were forced out of their, their land and massacred and by the tens of thousands. So my family, um, we have land given to us by the government and part of my heritage is Cherokee, but Cherokee actually wasn't a friend to the African Americans. So um, my family literally had to lobby for that. Um, there's a great amount of research. My community has always been the African American community. Um, I am aware of the Cherokee part. My family is buried. All of my family on one side of my one side of my family is still buried on this land that is given to us by the government in Alabama. But how did Africans get to the United States? And this is the first part of my research, and that is the background of African Americans in the United States. So we're gonna go through a timeline. The first Africans that came to the United States were actually indentured servants. So the first white people that came to the United States um, were people that were actually coming here to colonize it. And those are the ones that were massacring the native people. Um, a lot of those are Portuguese. So I hate the word that Columbus discovered America. How do you discover something when people are already here living in civilizations? It's not true. Um, so um, there was a lot of bloodshed that went on um, and they tried to enslave the native people and for a lot of reasons those didn't work. So after that, they actually started to bring white people over and those people were what they called indentured servants. At that time, uh, white people were also going to the African countries and they were setting up, and I want this theme to kind of, I'm gonna actually come back to this theme. So one of the things that we're doing, and also I want to also reference a Achebe, Things Fall Apart. Um, again, this is all for further reading. Things Fall Apart was something that I actually read in another class when I was in college, and Things Fall Apart is required reading for anyone that's getting their bachelor's degree. Um, in the college that I was in, you had to take um, an English literature class, and this was considered classic uh, reading if you wanted to get your degree. And so Things Fall Apart, Things Fall Apart by Achebe is a great book to read because it actually documents how white people were going in to African tribes and cultures and how they were setting up posts and how they were having missionaries coming over. I wanna talk about the missionary part. This is a conversation I've had with people that have PhDs in African American history and African history. And also we have quite a few friends that are actually first and second generation people from different African countries. And we kind of talked about how did the white colonizers come over to African countries and how did they actually get get into their 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 groups and you know before they actually was taking them out and, and trading them and don't think it was just trading there was actually a lot of wars that broke out and a lot of um 
a lot of things that went on. I'm gonna bring my husband out one more time. Honey, can you talk about the two African countries of different wars that went on in Africa where the African people were fighting against the colonizers? Well, there, there were many places uh, throughout uh, uh, West Africa where those wars broke out. Uh, many of the uh, many, many of the European uh, nations that were involved in the trade actually fermented war and would arm certain groups and encourage them to go to war against other indigenous groups like in Angola uh, and many other places where um, where there was uh, widespread uh, resistance to the, the Portuguese and their occupation by Queen, Queen Nzinga and uh, her, her refusing to continue to allow slaves or enslaved Africans to be exported uh, and, and traded. So there were many African kings that, that started to rebel against the practice and uh, again, uh, divide and conquer method uh, was used throughout West Africa. Thank you, sweetie. Okay, thank you, sweetie, for that. Again, I wanted him to kind of give some names and background. So now we understand that Europeans went into different parts of Africa, played different groups against each other. And over the course of three centuries, um, the first the first Africans here in the New World is what they called it, were indentured servants along with white indentured servants. However, at about by the 1600s, they had outlawed African people from living in the same way and getting that seven years worth of land and then you can, you can have your freedom. And so um, they decided that the Africans that they were importing to the different colonies were actually going to be slaves. A little bit of history also is that the highest number of Africans that were imported from the West African countries were sent to Brazil and were sent to um, countries um, in South America. South America actually has the highest amount of people of African descent living outside of, of Africa, the continent. But let's talk about the United States. So I just kind of wanted people to get a context for Europeans. Um, from things fall apart, it actually tells you a little bit about how Christian missionaries were coming over and they were trying to tell the native Africans, and this is a theme I want to kind of go back to, that they needed to worship a white Jesus and they needed to leave their, their native beliefs behind and they actually needed to bring, um, they needed to come over to Christianity. And Christianity and getting these native Africans to actually, um, you know, take up the Bible and learn the Bible versus their own native beliefs is how they actually set up schools. And now when you look at African countries and you look at people that are actually um, have money and have a you know, rise of the ranks, you'll see a lot of them have been westernized and have gone to missionary schools. Another great autobiography, autobiography is by a Nigerian um, called Fila. Uh, some people will realize or re will, may remember that there was a Broadway show about his life. Um, um, he actually was a Nigerian singer who actually was very well known. Um, they did a Broadway play about his life, but he also wrote a book, and it's called This Bee of a Life. I'm not going to say what the bee is, but figure it out. Um, again, I'll put that link there, but he actually talks about his parents were actually very involved in Nigeria um, in the military and they were involved in politics. And he was sent to a Christian school 
that have been started by Christian missionaries. Um, I just kind of want to put that out there so that people understand that this going to African countries, telling African people that there's something wrong with the way that they're living and getting them to come over to Christianity or a religion that is European based is a tact that has been used for thousands of years. Um, I want to talk about the first slaves that were brought to the United States when slavery was instituted in the indentured servant situation that the first Africans were, were, were using um, went away. I also want to kind of mention, if you read the John Hope Franklin book, he is also going to talk about that there actually are documented um, you know, historical records that say that even before Christopher Columbus came here, that there were a few African explorers that had had landed in what we call the United States today. But by and large, the 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 indentured servants of of African descent that were African, they were not on slave ships. They were actually ex they were brought along with explorers, and they lived on land along with the white indentured servants. So white people were actually enslaving, but not in the same way. Indentured servants is not the same as slaves. They did not, uh, when slavery was widely practiced in the United States, it was, it was not like indentured servitude. The slaves were not allowed to have their freedom after seven years. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna again, give some history behind that. So, the first slaves were brought to New Amsterdam, which New Amsterdam was actually New York City, um, in 1619. By 1690, every colony had slaves. So every colony in the United States had African slaves. One of the earliest revolts of slavery was done in 1739. Um, and this is called the Stono Rebellion. So for people that are trying to uh, like put a number, how many African people over um, the course of, I want to say three centuries were, were sent or a, a good two, two and a half centuries were being sent over to the United States. So estimates have put it up to about 10 million. So how many actually made it in these two centuries. So a lot of a lot of Africans died in the Middle Passage. A lot of Africans actually committed suicide. They'd rather jump into the water than actually go and live in a new world. Um, it, you know, who owned those ships? <laughs> Europeans, British people owned those ships. Portuguese people owned those ships. Again, if you go to the African American Museum, in Washington, D.C., which is a phenomenal, phenomenal place to go, you will see that they actually have, they have pictures of the ships. They have pictures of, um, they actually have some actual remnants of some of the slave ships. Um, it's a great, great, um, you know, if you're interested in African-American history, it's a great place to visit. Um, in 1808, um, Congress banned the, the importation of slaves. However, I'm going to talk a little bit about how that actually did not happen. Um, and 1831 to 1861, approximately 75,000 slaves escaped to the north using the Underground Railroad. I think that's a very, that's a large number. I don't think people realize how many African people were in the United States in the 1600s and 1700s. And when they started to rebel in the 1800s, um, you know, and I know people hear about Harriet Tubman, um, and she was very instrumental in the, the Underground Railroad. Um, 75,000 slaves is a huge number. Um, if you look at some of the research, there's places like North Carolina and South Carolina where they actually talked about 
there were more African slaves than there were actually white people and people of European descent living in North Carolina, South Carolina in the late 1700s and in the early 1800s. Um, in 1850, Congress passes the Fugitive Slave Act. That really mandated that government's participation, um, that mandated that government participate in the capture of escaped slaves. I think that's a very, um, very important, very important thing to know. Um, Fugitive Slave Act, that means that any African slave that is escaped from slavery must be taken back to their owner. So I want to, I want to make it clear that at that time, African people did not have any rights to their life. Um, people that were trying to get away from slavery, they escaped to um, the South, um, not to the South, they escaped to places like Canada. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the Dred Scott versus Stanford case. Um, Congress um, actually invalidated the 1808 uh, ban about importation of slaves. So in the Dred Scott Sanford case, that the outcome of that was that Congress does not have the right to ban slavery in states and that slaves are not citizens. The Dred versus Stanford case in 1850 is a very important case to talk about as I go through some of the timelines in the United States. So the 1857 case of Dred Scott versus Sanford basically took away the citizenship, excuse me, of African slaves. We're going to talk about the 14th Amendment, which has come up a lot in today's politics, but the 14th Amendment was actually put in a bit later. We're going to talk about that. And was specifically for African Americans to be citizens by their birthright. But I just want to emphasize that in 1850, when the Dred Scott and Sanford case went and said that slaves were not citizens, it was actually talking about people who had already been on this continent for over two centuries and was invalidating their citizenship. And that is part of my heritage. And again, that's why I sort of, when I first started saying that, when I want to hear about someone's history, I can hear the theoretical by a teacher, but I really want to hear from people that have actually lived it. And I can talk about my oral history. I can talk about the things that my grandparents went through. I actually have one family member, and this is an oral tradition. One, my grandmother's grandfather was taken from West Africa when he was 12 years old, along with his mother. Um, white slave traders ran into his village and they actually killed all the people in the village except for the women and children. And they actually captured my my grandfather when he was 12 and he was taken to a ship and I believe he was taken to um, the Caribbeans but he ended up in the United States and he died right before my mother was born so you know I used to ask my grandmother what was his name and she would remember his name because he never wanted to um, he never wanted his story to be forgotten so you know I have a direct link to Africa I also have a direct link to this country. Um, I'm going to talk about some other links that I have, but um, I'm, I'm not ashamed. You know, I'm not ashamed of the fact that the, my family's blood, sweat, and tears were actually here in this country, helped build this country, was not paid for this country, because I'm here. Just like I'm not ashamed that my family were Jehovah's Witnesses. I'm not. I'm not ashamed of it because I see how they took advantage 
of my parents coming from my, my ancestors being enslaved people who were denied the right to read and write and then were sharecroppers and moving forward. So another thing that I want to talk about is the fact that as people were slaves, they were denied the right to read and write. And that's why the classic slave narrative um, and reading, reading Frederick Douglass's narrative on how he learned to read and write, not only was it against the law for African slaves to learn to read and write, anyone that was caught teaching them to read and write was killed. You could be killed for that. Now, why was it important for the government? Because we're gonna go all the way with this. We want I wanna talk about segregation. I wanna talk about Brown versus Board of Education. And I wanna compare it to the Jehovah Witnesses. But why was it so important for this government that they were so committed to keeping African slaves from learning how to read and write that they would kill anyone that was caught trying to teach them so that they could control them, so that they could exploit them. That is why miseducation and not getting education keeps people in a subjugated state. And it is a tactic that has been used to control people. And that's why I wanted to start with the African-American experience before I talked about specifically the African-American experience in the United States. And this is not to attack any other ethnic group. And I want to give a reference, my, my husband and I talked about this, not every single white person was a white supremacist or of hearing the system of white supremacy. Um, and I want people to understand that this was a systematic thing that was going on. This was bigger than one a white person saying, I don't like black people. There were actually white people, even in the throes of slavery that were totally against it. And they actually created the abolitionist movement. So these people that were white and were Irish or of any, any of these ethnic groups that were coming from Europe and were totally against slavery and the enslavement of slaves, they created the abolitionist movement. Another group of white people that have always historically been against slavery and against African slaves is the Quakers. So they have always assisted, and if you read over Harriet Tubman and the Underground Railroad, you will see that they were assisted. There's no way that 75,000 people um, were able to get through the Underground Railroad and move to places where they would be able to be a little bit freer without the help of the abolitionist movement, um, society, and the Quakers. So again, we're researched enough. This is not a us versus them. This is, I'm telling you the history of African-American people in the United States. Overwhelmingly, this was a country that believed that African people were inferior and taught that and implemented rules, did not allow African people to learn to read, did not want them to get married, which is why you see that there's a whole jumping the broom thing that goes on. It's a tradition that African-American people still um, follow, but I did kind of want to just kind of give a background on the education part. And I also want to talk about other groups um, and how, you know, this is not us versus them. This is just the actual facts. So, um, when Abraham Lincoln was elected president, it angered the southern states, and that was in 1860. Um, in 1863, Abraham Lincoln uh, proclaimed that all slaves and rebellious territories are forever free. But I just want to uh, speak on a little bit about Abraham Lincoln. That, that was really about the Civil War, and this is for further reading. Um, it wasn't because he was so pro-African slaves. This was more about 
a political thing that he was talking about. So I just kind of wanted to start there. Um, even though the proclamation, even though the proclamation was given by Abraham Lincoln, um, it is important to know that slavery really actually didn't end. Again, this is historically now because I have family that, you know, not only that, we have research. So um, Confederate states did not adhere to the proclamation of emancipation at all. They had something called black codes. So they, they literally were refusing um, and this was passed by the white legislators of uh, former Confederate uh, states to say that they were not going to abide by the Proclamation of Emancipation. Um, my, my grandmother's grandfather lived through all of that. And it's really funny because I always knew that my grandmother was going to be, that that grandmother was going to live longer than any of my other grandparents. And, and it was actually true because my my grandmother's grandfather lived to be, she said over 110. So he actually was able to live past being taken from an African country with his mother to come over to, I believe he was in the Caribbean before he came here, and then to actually have children, have grandchildren, and actually see them actually start to get from the South and actually move in different areas where they could have a little bit more freedom. In 1868, the 14th Amendment, which we talked about, um, was a direct response to the Dred Scott decision. Um, and that was um, to allow African-Americans to have citizenship. As I mentioned, Dred Scott basically was saying that African-Americans, and they weren't called African-Americans then. I wanna be clear that you're gonna hear me refer to people of African descent that were slaves in a few different ways. I may say black, I may say African-American, I may say Afro-American. I have grandparents who to their dying day, they called themselves colored. And I, we all knew who they were talking about. But color is an umbrella term because, again, um, there is a lot of Native Americans that actually moved into the African-American community. Um, learning my history, going back and reading historical documents, you'll see mulattoes, you'll see people that they said were colored, but they were really brown-skinned Native Americans that actually moved into the African-American community. Um, there's a lot of a lot a lot of great history for those that are interested. Again, this is me just doing a top level discussion on it. In 1870, um, the 15th Amendment was ratified, giving African Americans the right to vote. So by 1870, things should have been good. But again, there were a lot of former Confederate states that did not want to abide by any of these. By 1879, thousands of African Americans decided that they wanted to leave these southern states. Um, and I, and I, and you know, again, some of my family was a part of that migration to get away from the oppression of these former Confederate states that really wanted no parts of African American people having any any rights. Um, no matter what the government was trying to tell them. In 1881, um, Tennessee passes Jim Crow segregation laws. And I wanna, and I'm gonna talk about segregation. So segregating state railroads, and segregation went across the board. It wasn't just railroads, it was schools, it was land. Um, you know, I actually, in part of the class that I took when we were talking about African American studies, there's a lot of research that says that Jim Crow was just as bad as slavery and that African Americans literally, even though they were free, they literally could not, they couldn't go anywhere, they couldn't, they couldn't live in certain places, they couldn't drink from certain water fountains, they couldn't do a lot of things. And again, this is things that um, my own family actually 
um, you know, talked about. So now we're going to kind of move forward um, a little bit and talk about a few more things that I want to just make sure that people are aware of. Um, I'm just going through my research um, that I wanted to hit on. Um, and we talked about the Emancipation Proclamation and things like that. Um, let's talk about, I want to talk a little bit more about some of the systematic things that were done to African Americans. And again, that's when I talk about the system of white supremacy, the system of oppression. Um, there was a genocide convention in 1988 um, and there was a lot of controversy over it because um, there were a lot of black um, intellectual, a lot of black intelligentsia that wanted to be a part of the conversation to talk about the systematic way in which the African American community was not only oppressed but um, marked for genocide um, along with Native Americans. Um, it's a lot. It's a great. Again, I'm not going to get into that book. I just say, please read it. Um, it wasn't that long ago, so I think it's important um, to talk about. Um, I do want to hit on a few more things before I turn it over to talking about talking about the Jehovah Witnesses and African Americans. But what is my point of talking about the African American experience in the United States? It's, it's really because I want people to understand the plight of the African-American and how Jehovah Witnesses took advantage of where they were and where they were going. Since I'm a third generation Jehovah Witness, my grandparents were actually targeted in the 1950s to convert to the Jehovah Witnesses. So I want people to understand when you talk to African Americans and Hispanics and non-white people that were systematically targeted and you hear them saying you're third and fourth generation Jehovah Witness, how is that possible understanding the history of the United States? Well, I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. But I wanna, I, I, I felt, and again, I have to give credit to my, my husband. I didn't feel like I could literally have a good conversation about the African American and the Jehovah Witness organization unless I actually set the foundation of the African American and how they were treated and what they went through in the United States. And I'm not pulling any punches because again, my husband is an educator and I know for a fact that in a lot of public schools, they literally don't give this education. I literally got my education because I had my specific background of my stepfather and his and his family um, that have been long-term people that have taught in historically black black colleges and university have public have published papers have lived in West Africa even before I was born. So not every African American person is going to have that experience. And even when I went to college. And I was taking courses, and of course we had we had people that were in these courses that were not African American. It was literally the first time that I realized how miseducated the rest of the country is about my community, or just the stereotypes that they have that are not based in fact. And you know, I don't. I, I'm not going to have a conversation with someone who doesn't want to hear it or is not interested. You're free to click off this video at any time. It's not going to change the fact that there is African American Museum in D.C. Um, there's African American museums throughout the country. There are, you know, um, people that, excuse me, are teaching this. There are over. 80, 90 historically black colleges and universities throughout this country. There is a whole history. And for people that are interested, 
I think it's important. What I don't see is a lot of people actually talking specifically about the African American experience and the Jehovah Witness organization. And I want to take it a step further and talk about what I see as a failure. So um, there's a few points that I kind of want to emphasize before I turn this over to talking about my second point, which is Jehovah Witnesses and the African American community. And I want to give a historical background on that. Again, I'm citing everything. Because a lot of times when people talk, you're like, where are you getting this information from? I know that's how I am. And it's not because I'm a cynic, but also I'm actually a published researcher and I'm actually a published writer. So I'm actually someone who I want to know where you got this information from. I don't just want you talking because you're just making stuff up. You know, there's a lot of miseducation that has happened, not just in the African American community, but in the American consciousness, but also in the Jehovah Witness organization. And that's where I want to focus on. So there are just some key things I want people to keep in mind when you're thinking about African American history in the United States. The Emancipation Proclamation, which happened in 1863, was not 100% an ending of slavery. Um, it was done to encourage slaves to run away, to weaken the Confederacy. It was a war tactic. Um, it did not end slavery in the United States. Um, it also left a loophole for black people to be re-enslaved if they were convicted of a crime which gives way to the modern day prison complex and its ability to exploit free labor. Um, this has been going on for over a century, even after the Emancipation Proclamation was signed. Jim Crow was a law that, um, they were laws that were made to enforce racial segregation in the American South between the end of Re Reconstruction in 1877 and the beginning of the Civil Rights Movement in 1950. In the Plessy versus Ferguson decision in 1896, the United, the United States Supreme Court that ruled that separate but equal facilities for African Americans did not violate the 14th Amendment. They ignored the fact that the facilities for African Americans were inferior to those intended for white people. So, um, and this is another important thing because you're going to, segregation is going to come up when we talk about the beginnings of Jehovah Witnesses and African Americans. Um, I have no problem with people wanting to be around people of their own community. That is human nature. Um, I like being around people that are African American. I like being around people that are not African American. It's not a big deal. I'm not gonna. I'm not going to apologize wanting to be around people that share a, a community and culture. And I'm not offended by because I have friends that are Hispanic. They love being around other Hispanic people. I'm not offended by that. I have friends that are Asian. I don't get offended because they want to hang around other people that are Asian. It doesn't bother me. I'm not. I'm not xenophobic. I'm not someone who think who thinks that you have to explain yourself if you want to, you know, be around people that look like you. Here's my problem: when you try to make things less of because they're not a part of your community, and that was the problem with with Jim Crow is that of course it's gonna be predominantly African-American neighborhoods, and of course it's gonna be predominantly white neighborhoods. It shouldn't matter where people live if they are citizens of the United States, they should actually still get the same education. And this is, um, and they should get the same access to, um, you know, to education. And that's kind of why I'm critical. My husband's another person that's critical of busing because busing is a band-aid for the real issue. Busing does not fix that you have 
education in African American communities that are substandard. And they're substandard because the government is not funding them the same way that they fund. And this is state government and, and, and county government is not funding them the same way that they fund all white public education. And again, not only is my husband an educator, he's also in a few black organizations and has, has actually won awards for talking about um, great freedom of people of all backgrounds to get the same education. I do actually want to reference a great book to talk about this further. It's called Savage Inequalities by Jonathan Kozel. Jonathan Kozel is actually a white Jewish man, but he actually took the country to task for not giving all children, regardless of their background, regardless of their class, regardless of the color of their skin, the same education. So the way the, sec the education is set up, the way that it was even back in Jim Crow was that it was one step away from denying African Americans that were just coming out of slavery to have an education that was equal to white people. Now I'm gonna go, and even though I said after I do Jehovah's Witnesses, I'm gonna give my own personal experience, I'm also gonna intertwine it. My grandparents <clears throat> are from sharecroppers. And my grandfather and my grandmother shared with me that when they were going to school, that the white people that were in the town near them burned down their school and burned down their town. Ku Klux Klan people actually went to town and burned the houses down. Two of my grandfather's family members were hung, which is called lynching. I'm gonna talk about that in a minute. Um, but the townspeople were furious that these people that had been slaves for centuries wanted to go to school. So this miseducation and not wanting people that are African American to have an education and have an education at the same level that they're having an education, and what I mean by that is the white ruling class, is not new. This has been going on for centuries, and again, I'm citing I'm citing this research, so this is not me, this is not the oracle talking, this is me citing the research. I'm talking Ples Plessy versus Ferguson, I'm talking Brown versus Board of Education, I'm talking about Savage Inequalities, a book by Jonathan Kozel that has all the research in there for you to read. This is what this country was doing, it was miseducating people of African descent for a specific reason, to keep them subservient and to keep them from having the power and to be able to rise in the ranks because they still wanted to be the ruling class. And this is what Savage Inequalities was talking about. This was the basis of Brown versus education. I don't agree with busing because you're, you're not dealing with the overall issue. But there would have never had to have been a Plessy versus Ferguson or a Brown versus education if this country allowed people of African descent to have an education. We talked a little bit about the history of Jim Crow laws. So next we're gonna talk about, uh, sorry, I have to move this over. Um, so I want to talk a little bit more about segregation. Um, so African American people were not allowed to have access to schools and churches and facilities um, because of their race. Um, imagine, imagine, you know, having that history. So I'm, I'll talk a little bit about my own personal oral tradition. So one of the last times that I talked with my grandparents, um, I wanna say one more thing before I continue. I actually also have a different experience because all of the male members in my family, including my husband, served in the military. 
So my grandfather, my paternal grandfather was in the Navy. My maternal grandfather was in the Army. My maternal grandfather is actually in the history books. And that's a story for another day, but that's one of the secrets that I learned many years later. Um, so I actually come from a pretty interesting family, even though they were Jehovah Witnesses. My father <laughs> is also former military. When my father was disfellowshipped, he actually enlisted in the army and finished out his bid. My husband <laughs> is also in the military and was in the military for over six years and used the military to pay for his undergrad. So, um, my, my grandfather actually fought in World War II. So one of the questions that I had for my grandparents at the time that I left was talking to them is how did it feel to fight for a country that treated you like a second class citizen? I remember my paternal grandfather telling me what it was like when he actually came back from fighting in Germany and then having to come back to United States and actually go to restaurants and go in the back door or actually couldn't use bathroom facilities and had to pee um, on the side of the road. And, you know, I was like, I would have been so angry. Like, I wouldn't have wanted to, you know, how could you... Like, how could you put your life on the line for a country that treated you so terribly? And my grandfather looked at me and he said, I did it for you. I did it for my grandchildren because I still believe in the fact that I want you guys to have the freedoms that you had. I never thought that I would see the day um, when we would have a person of African descent as a president. I never thought I'd see the day when I could move freely throughout the United States. So, um, you know, my grandfathers, you know, although I didn't 100% believe, agree with that, that was their truth. And I'm not one to like overly censor people from thinking or believing what they want. They have a right of their own ownership. But it was a very deep, deep conversation. Both my grandparents were, both my grandfathers were functioning illiterate. My, um, my paternal grandfather literally had been working since he was eight years old, selling apples and oranges on the side of the road. He actually enlisted in the Navy when he was 17 and a half years old. Um, my grandfather worked until he was 75 years old. Both my grandfathers worked until they were in their late 70s. Even after they had retired from their jobs, they actually had worked a second job until they retired. Um, and again, my stepfather was in the army. My father was in the army. My husband, my husband has never been a Jehovah's Witness. So this is more just about the history of segregation, even in the military. So my grandfather, they the, the one that's in the history books, it actually has an event that started in um, being in a segregated army. Um, my No one told me the story that got my grandfather in the history books until after he passed away. Um, and also, the other part of it, which I'm going to talk about when I talk about the failures of the, the Jehovah Witness organization, the African American community. But I just want to kind of talk a little bit more about racial segregation because when people, you know, and I never really heard these things until I actually went to university. I didn't go to historically black college and university. I went to a world renowned university uh, for grad and undergrad. And um, I was around people of all backgrounds, but you know, you, you don't know who you're gonna talk to, especially when you're talking about race and class and gender and these type of things. But some of the ignorant comments to me, I was just so floored, you know? And I was like, I actually can't allow people to talk about, um, you know, my ancestry because I'm like, my family is all military. 
So even though my family was treated like second class citizens, my grandparents fought for the freedoms of all people in the United States. So I'm like, not only do I have native indigenous family, not only do I have family that was in the military, I'm like, <laughs> you know, the United States fabric is running through my veins. I can't allow people to degrade people who suffered for my right to sit here today and talk about what they went through. So there's no shame. There's nothing but I am so absolutely proud that no matter what my grandparents went through, no matter what my ancestors went through, that we are still here. And the reason that I'm doing this video today is because I want people to realize that there's more to life than what people tell you. Because sometimes what people tell you and teach you is to keep you from thinking for yourself and for having the freedoms that they have. So racial segregation was one of the ways that they marginalized certain groups of people so that they would not be empowered. Busing, I talked a little bit about that. Um, I'm not gonna get into that um, any further. Um, the Little Rock Nine, if anybody's interested. Um, the Little Rock Nine were a group of nine black students who were, who were enrolled at Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas in 1957. Their um, attendance at that school was a test of Brown versus education, a landmark case in 1954 that ruled that segregation in public schools was unconstitutional. On, the, on September 1st, the first day of classes at Central High School, um, the Arkansas National Guard was called to, black, to block the black students' entry into the high school. So the National Guard, the governor of Arkansas, called the Arkansas National Guard to block these nine black students from entering Central High School. The president, Eisenhower, sent in federal troops to escort the Little Rock Nine into the school. So again, you had things being done at the federal level, but then you had states that were rebelling and saying, we don't want these black children going to school with white kids. And if you ever look at the actual pictures, you will see the groups of white people actually yelling at these students as they're walking into school. This was in 1957. So again, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't that that long ago. These people I actually got to meet <clears throat> some of the people that were a part of the Little Rock Nine. So I actually got to interview them, which was a phenomenal thing for me. And so, you know, when I did my first video, when I first decided to start doing videos, and I said that me pursuing my education and moving up the ranks in my professional life has allowed me to experience things that I thought I would never experience. And I think that's one of the reasons that I'm so proud of the life that I had. It's because I didn't use my background as a Jehovah Witness or my background as an ex-Jehovah Witness to stop me from living. Um, we talked a little bit about the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Um, we talked about redlining. We didn't talk about that. Redlining is actually one of the last things that I want to talk about. But what I actually want to, um, I'm going to talk about redlining. I'm going to talk about lynching. I'm going to talk about lynching specifically of military, only because I have the military background. But again, I think that a lot of people are not historically taught about some of the things that I'm, I'm touching on. And I'm, you know, that's why I'm taking the time. I'm being a little bit tedious because I'm taking the time and not actually just talk about it, but give you the tools that you need to do the research for yourself. So red is redlining. 
Redlining is one of the most institutional uh, racist um, behaviors in the United States that allows there to be such a disparity between African Americans and other groups of people because home ownership is one of the ways that we are actually, um, we are used to access our wealth. So what is redlining? Redlining is a process by which banks and other institutions refuse to offer mortgages and offer terrible uh, rates to communities in certain neighborhoods based on their racial and ethnic composition. It is one of the clearest examples of institutional racism in the United States. Although it was formally outlawed in 1968, it actually continues in various forms to this day. What was redlining? So local governments continue to enforce housing segregation through what they call exclusionary zoning laws, which prohibited the sale of property to black people. So um, by the time the Supreme Court um, found that these racially restrictive laws were and behaviors were unconstitutional, this was in 1947, the practice was so widespread that it was difficult to invalidate the practices and almost impossible to reverse. According to a magazine article in 1940, 80% of neighborhoods in Chicago and Los Angeles carried racial restrictive covenants. The federal government um, was not involved in housing in, uh, in the 1930s um, when the Federal Housing Administration was created. However, after that, they actually got involved in it um, and they created the Homeowners Loan Coalition. And what the Homeowners Loan Coalition did was they actually put out these books, these FHA underwriting books that actually color-coded neighborhoods when people were looking for neighborhoods and when they were trying to secure investments and it was also a way to say which neighborhoods were off limits for issuing mortgages. Now, this is a very interesting. Green represented in-demand and up-and-coming neighborhoods where professional people live. The neighborhoods were explicitly hom hom homogeneous and lacking a single foreigner or Negro. Blue was still desirable, but they had reached the peak. Um, they were suitable due to their low risk of infiltration of non-white people. Yellow was definitely declining, um, and then there was red. These maps would help the government decide which properties were eligible for FHA backing. Green and blue neighborhoods which normally had a majority white population were considered good investments. And it was very easy to get loans in these areas. Yellow neighborhoods and red neighborhoods were normally ineligible for FHA backing. So again, <clears throat> this is touching on when my grandparents were alive. And the only reason that my grandparents were able to navigate through some of these behaviors that the government was doing to a large portion of African Americans is because, as I mentioned before, all of my family were military men. But let's talk about how even them being military did not stop them from the lynching campaign. So a new report has tallied that there were 4,000 lynchings of black people in the South during the Jim Crow era, and about 700 of them were part of previous tallies of Southern lynching. I'm actually gonna say that it was probably a lot more than that that was, ever, that was never recorded. Um, 
there was an equal justice initiative that actually said that a lot of these racial terror lynchings were people that were killed because of some type of perceived social transgression, like accidentally bumping into someone that was white or because they were incorrectly accused of a crime. Um, if you ever go to the African American Museum, you will see that there is the, the casket of Emmett Till, which is one of the, the most famous lynching um, of people that was lynched and actually set off the civil rights movement um, that really caused the country to come face to face with the terror that African-American people were enduring. Um, and if you learn anything about that, if you actually go to the African-American Museum and see the whole thing that they've done, they don't just show the casket, they actually give you a great sort of, uh, you know, they talk about what happened to Emmett Till. And what happened to Emmett Till, just very quickly, is that Emmett Till, um, he went to a soda shop, he was not from the South, and he whistled, Maybe um, there have been a lot of in, you know inconsistent versions of this story, but whatever he did, it was a very innocent thing that he did. They lynched him. Um, they 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 found him in the river, um, and the mother actually um, made them do an open casket because she wanted to show what was done to her son and um, how terrible it was. Um, there's a lot of people that were involved in this that actually came forward and actually talked about, um, you know, there, you know, some of the white people involved and, you know, upon, upon their deathbed have actually talked about their sorrow and their remorse and actually some of the things that he, he was accused of doing, they've actually come clean with it. But let's just be clear that the point is that Black people were not safe. Africans, people of African descent in the United States were not safe. We were murdered and with no, with no way, no retribution, no representation by the government, we were lynched. I had family members that were lynched. And I'm not even talking about the rape of African women in the United States. There's a lot of history on that. Um, a great book to read, um, if you ever want to do the research on it, is Stolen Women. Um, it's a great book that talks about African women that were raped um, since they first came to this, this uh, country and how that has impacted African American women to this day. So centuries of murder, centuries of, of rape in the African community. Um, the African American community. And again, these are things that are not really taught um, in public schools, especially even in high school. You actually have to want to be interested in this to kind of learn about the African American community. Um, but all of these things have a lot to do with the African American climate um, and what African Americans were going through. So Georgia had the most lynchings during the period that was studied. Miss, Mississippi had the second most, and Louisiana had the third most. Fl Florida had the highest rate per capita of lynching with um, about, about one black resident being lynched annually. But since um, I talked about the veterans, and businessmen being targeted of lynching and because that affects my family specifically. Um, I want to talk about what happened to African-American veterans um, that were lynched. And this is what the research shows that no one was more at risk of experiencing violent and targeted racial terror than, that to, than black veterans who had proven their valor and courage as soldiers. This wasn't just in the Civil War, but in World War I and World War II. Because of their military service, Black veterans were seen as a particular threat to Jim Crow and racial subordination. Thousands of Black veterans were assaulted, threatened, abused, or lynched following the military service. Many owners of profitable Black businesses were also lynched and burned 
as a form of economic castration for black people who dare to defy the status quo. So I, I'm not gonna go all the way until today. Um, I just kind of wanted to talk about, because African-Americans have come a long way and you know I'm glad to have seen a lot of the progress over the oppressive systematic tactics. But a lot of those things that I'm talking about are ways that impacted the African-American experience in the United States. Um, I tried to intertwine that with my own background, my, my family's own background. But I think it's important and I wanted to hit on the 1950s, specifically in 1960s, because I wanted to hit on, um, not just the 1950s and the 1960s, but I wanted to hit on the period that the Jehovah Witnesses actually started targeting African Americans for inclusion into the Jehovah Witness organization. So as I mentioned, um, we're getting into part two, which is the background of the Jehovah Witnesses um, in the African-American community. And um, I was able to get some great information. The abstract that I'm actually quoting from um, is, is, a, is a journal article that I came across called Jehovah Witnesses, Blacks and Discrimination. Um, and it's a journal article by Jerry Bergman. He's a PhD. But some of the other people, and I'm actually going to leave this at the end. Um, if you've come across this video before I actually have sat there and added these, please give me a day or so. Um, but I'm going to read them. Um, this one is the one that I actually, I came across too. But there's a history of Jehovah Witnesses from a Black American perspective. And this was actually done by Free Folk Carr. Um, great, great to read if you're interested in the African American experience. Um, and this is along with this particular journal article. The person for repo is an African American who was in the Jehovah Witness organization. Another good book is Jehovah Witnesses and Racial Prejudice, Warner Cone. I'm going to talk about Cone quite a bit, so pay attention to. Um, these, these last names that I'm hitting because I'm just going to reference their last name. Um, another one is Michael Jones, Blacks in the Watchtower from Free Minds Journal. Journal. Um, it was published in July, August 1983. Um, there's some Black Americans perspective, Free Minds, uh, 1993. Watchtower Society, um, Letter, 1973. So um, there's another really good, um, I'm actually using even Jehovah Witness um, references in their own stuff. Um, another really great thing to read is a journal article, Negro Jehovah Witnesses, Adoption in the Ghetto. Um, this was in the Religious Movements in Contemporary America. And this was actually published by Princeton University Press in 1974. So again, I'm giving you this information so that you can arm yourself. Don't just listen to me. Do the, do the information for yourself. But, excuse me, I'm going to take a little bit of swallow. But um, this, this is very interesting. Um, this, this particular journal article is one of the journal articles that changed my life. I want to just say that growing up <clears throat> as an African-American in the Jehovah Witness organization, and I've been very clear, you know, very honest that I really didn't think that there were a lot of people <laughs> that were not African-American that were in the Jehovah's Witness organization. Because even when I went to district conventions, it was overwhelmingly African-American and non-white where I live. So even, in, and again, this is perception for a lot of people that may study philosophy or 
um, know a little bit about it. Your perception is your truth. So, excuse me, from my own perception, this is what I saw. So, you know, of course, I knew that there were other places where, you know, it was an all white area and there was a white congregation. But I always believed that this was an organization that had a lot of African Americans in the religion. But what does the research say? Did anybody ever study it? So let's talk a little bit about that. Um, the, the Jehovah, and, and this is, I want to give some caveats so people don't run crazy with this. If you're listening to this and you live in Poland, um, this is not about you. What I'm talking about right now is about the United States only. And also, if you live in, say, Ghana, or you live in Cameroon, obviously, your, <clears throat> your country and when you go to a Jehovah's Witness congregation, or if you're an ex-Jehovah's Witness in Cameroon or Ghana or Japan, then of course the majority of your congregation is going to be reflective of your community, meaning that you live in homogeneous societies, you live in homogeneous cities and countries where the non, you know, non-people of your indigenous country is of what you are. This is not about that. United States is it's a very different place because there's a lot of people of different backgrounds. And I think even when you look at different religious groups, normally when you look at the religious group, it's very reflective of the numbers in the society at large. But what does the studies, has anybody ever studied, like what are, what, are, what is the racial background of any study that has been done um, about the Jehovah's Witness organization in the United States. So the first thing is yes, there have been studies that have been done and what have they found? And I'm gonna just read this verbatim. Um, every study showed that 50, at least 52% of Jehovah's Witnesses in the United States were non-white and were not, uh, you know, but were not reflected in leadership positions. So let me just let me just read this verbatim. One study found that 52% of all American witnesses are African American or non-white Hispanic. Yet the leadership from circuit overseer and above is almost totally white. And I'm also going to, you know, this is from Kuzman and Latchman, who did the research. How does that, like, compare to other religions? So, um, Lutheran Church um, only has a 33% that are Black or Hispanic. Mormons only have 6% that are Black or Hispanic. Presbyterians have 7% who are Black or Hispanic. Episcopalians has 10% that are Black and Hispanic. Methodist has 24% that are Black or Hispanic. And even Baptist, which has the highest number of minority members outside of the witnesses, only 31% were Black or Hispanic. So again, this also, and this wasn't like the the um, the the um, research that was done went to a place where there wasn't enough people. Um, where they went, it was all Jehovah's Witnesses. It wasn't. It's just that of the people that were researched, that fundamentally it is an organization who is majority non-white, Hispanic, or African American, but. Why do we why do we think that is? Why is it that there is, um, and I'll put it another way, that this is um, another thing that was said is that this is one of the only major non-ethnic denomination that consists of a majority of people from minority groups. I think that's fascinating because when you go to Bethel, when you look at the makeup of the governing body, when you look at the historical background 
of the governing body. And I know in another video I said that uh, Samuel Heard is a token and that there was a lot of controversy about the, there was a lot, not only was there a lot of controversy, there was a lot of pressure on the organization from not just inside the organization, but outside the organization to say, even though you have the highest number of, um, of people from minority groups in your religious organization in the United States, it is not reflected in your leadership. It is not reflected in who is ruling this organization. And if you are proclaiming that you don't see race, if this is for all people, why is it not reflected? There was a lot of, and I'm gonna actually re reference this because a lot of the stuff that I'm referencing is things that most Jehovah Witnesses, most African Americans are not aware of. Like I said, when I was doing research and I was looking in a religious journal article when I was taking my world religions class and I came across the article of an African-American who had a PhD, but is also a former Jehovah Witness who had done all this research to show how they had actively went after African-Americans from the 1950s and 60s, I was floored. And I promised myself that one day I was actually going to do something to educate people on what's going on because I only came across it by accident. I wasn't looking for this article. I was actually looking for another article and actually came across this because it was actually in the same uh, periodical that I was flipping through. But let's get back to, 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 to some of the theories on why there is such a high percentage of African Americans in the Jehovah Witness organization specifically. Because it has such a high number, higher than even Baptist, which has 31% that's black or non-white Hispanic. Why is why is why would African Americans specifically be attracted to this organization? So here's what some of the research um, talked about. Um, and I, I talked about this before, is that a lot of research and theorists believe that African Americans were attracted to this organization because the policies that they were presenting to African Americans in the 1950s, and I want people to remember what I had talked about when I went through, you know, went through the history of the 1950s and the 1960s. African American people were fighting for racial equality in society and were still feeling discrimination and having to do marches. Here comes a group of religious people that are promising Jehovah Witnesses that are African American. They specifically targeted the South and they specifically targeted African Americans that had left the South into the North and promised them that they would be in an environment that didn't see race. They promised them that all of the things that they felt in society where people were being discriminatory against them, that this was not the case in the Jehovah Witness organization. They actively recruited African Americans and promised a policy of racial equality. Worldwide Blacks who became Jehovah Witnesses usually felt that they would be welcomed as human beings and equal to other members. I want people to think about that for a minute. A car, someone that I that I referenced, he said that even though there were many segregated kingdom halls in the Deep South, it was much better than the Christian churches, um, and that black men felt that they could achieve a status in the Watchtower even if he was only average in intelligence and in secular skills. I'm going to read um, something else, um, and this is from Cooper from 1953, he was a sociologist and wrote, wrote about um, what was 
What was aiding witness missionaries working in Africa to get black people, even in Africa and in the African American communities to come to the Watchtower? And so Cooper actually talked about specifically that there was an attraction of African Americans to the Watchtower. And this is what Cooper said, as a publisher in the New World Society, they are convinced that they are Jehovah's chosen people. One is no longer identified as Bill Green, warehouse clerk or shoe salesman, lower or middle, lower class Negro. As a publisher, he is Brother Green, the Westview study servant, one of Jehovah's elect. It is an identity impervious to outside opinion. By following the society's rules for publishing and morality, they are showing their place among the chosen. Brother Green gave a sense of purity and superiority factors of important, importance to American Negroes. And important for a new image of self-esteem to overwhelmingly feelings of self-hatred. Um, again, I'm hitting on some points, and again, I just think it's very important for people to understand why, what was the draw of African American people to this organization? And I'm gonna I'm gonna tie this in to the truth about the truth when it comes to Jehovah's Witnesses. So let's go back. Let's go back to October 15, 1919. What was the golden age teaching about African Americans when it first was being out? And I think everybody knows that the golden age was the precursor to the awake. If I'm wrong, I apologize, but I'm pretty sure. So the golden age says from a criminal uh, viewpoint, the desirability of sobering the Southern Negro speaks volumes for national prohibition. Another article refers to Orientals as coolies who were cutthroats and murderers. This is this is Jehovah's Witness. This is Jehovah's Witness literature. One state that the British Empire um, nations that are all ruled by whites, the Watchtower described them as having superior mental, moral, or physical force. This is in the May 5th, 1926 Watchtower. Let's go back to Russell and Rutherford. What, what, what's it? Cause I'm gonna hit hard and I'm not, I'm referencing everything. I'm not gonna read it. I'm not gonna read this article verbatim. I'm using this. And again, this is not just this article, but I said this is gonna make be the main article that I'm referencing when I'm talking about the Jehovah's Witnesses. Cause this kind of has a lot of the research that I actually did. Um, again, I'm not going to read it verbatim. I'm, I'm going to link everything so you can read it for yourself. But what were Russell and Rutherford's feelings on African Americans when they were a part of it, when they were starting it? So let's be clear. That's one of the reasons I wanted people to understand that even though in the 1950s and such, when Africans and African Americans were um, being targeted to join this organization that when you went back to the 1919s and 1914 and eight, late 1800s, what was Russell and Rutherford teaching even when they incorporated it? So be clear that even though the Watchtower claimed that all races were biological brothers and all descendants of Adam and Eve, they taught the doctrine of biological inferiorities of the black race. Formal segregation of blacks was rigidly, rigidly enforced in the Jehovah's Witness organization during Russell and by Rutherford, and even as late as the 1950s. How do I know that? I don't need to read this. My grandparents went to segregated congregations. 
Now, we're not talking about self-segregated. Again, if you go to certain cities in the United States, you're going to an all-Hispanic area. You're going to a Puerto Rican area. You're going to an area that is predominantly Mexican or Mexican-American. The congregation is going to reflect that. You're going to go to a predominantly African-American neighborhood. The congregation is going to reflect that. However, uh, self-segregation is different from segregated. And so here's uh, what I mean by segregation. Um, in the Watchtower enforced segregation, in the Watchtower April 1st, 1914, on page 110, see how granular I'm getting with it? You can look this up for yourself. Um, drama as respects the whites, we have been compelled to assign the colored friends to the gallery. Some were offended at this arrangement. We have received numerous letters from the colored friends. Some claim that's not right to make a difference. Others that have been indignant and, uh, you know, denouncing that, that colored people are enemies. We suggest that if a suitable place could be found in which drama could be a benefit for the colored people, we would grad, grad, gladly make the arrangements. So, um, but we have to cooperate, other people have to cooperate with us because we're going to make, make the decision that's best for the white collective. You understand? This is, this is how Russell and Rutherford thought. The, in, the administrator concluded that the Watchtower's um, interest was to put ahead efforts um, to achieve um, that the Watchtower interests were put ahead of efforts to achieve racial justice and human rights. Um, and um, even in 1974, um, a first person account of what it was like to be an African-American during that time, um, I'm just gonna quote him. He's, he said, I'm not saying Jehovah's Witnesses are perfect. This is an African-American who was at Bethel in 1974. At times, I detect the now certain ones, a leftover attitude of racial superiority, and I have sometimes seen a certain uncomfortableness of some of them when in close association with people of other races. So this utopian, utopian idea that when you got to Bethel, that everybody was a brother and that there was no racial issues is, is absolutely not true at all. I mean, again, there have been people that talk about it, both the good and the bad. Is there a sense of brotherhood? Yes. Do people self-segregate? Of course. So someone who goes to Bethel as an African-American man and finds other African-American people that look out for him is going to have a much different experience than an African-American man that goes to Bethel and is put in an area where there's not a lot of people um, there that are African-American. The people that he's around, um, they don't have a lot of familiarity with African-Americans other than the stereotypes they see in the media. Um, and they're actually going to feel, he's actually going to feel some of the um, detachment and, and, and issues that this person that, that wrote about this in this, in this book. Um, being, and, and it goes actually deeper than this because again, I'm actually gonna talk about the, the p things that have been relayed to me by the people I know personally that have lived in Bethel and have been really honest. Even if they had good experiences, they were really honest about some of the things that were very startling to them. But what, and I actually in another, another video talked about the time that my grandfather told me something that was taught to him when he became an elder um, and was taught to him. And again, I, I, wanna, I wanna hit on the fact that my grandfather that told me this was functioning illiterate, but he was an elder. Not only was my grandfather was an African-American, was functionally illiterate and an elder, he was a presiding overseer. But when he went to elder school, they taught him that African-Americans were a cursed group. 
And I remember when my grandfather thought he was sneaking and telling me something. And I, I talked about this because again, I'd already been educated. So when my grandfather told me this, I looked at my grandfather and was really shocked that he actually believed it. But this is what this is the this is what they were telling African Americans that had actually moved up the ranks in the Jehovah Witness organization. And there was even more to it. This is what they believed when they told African Americans that they were of an inferior group. This comes straight from the Golden Age magazine. And this is what it says. It says, and this is not only, I'm not going to just tell you that it's from the Golden Age magazine. I'm going to tell you that it's from the July 24th, 1929 Golden Age. And this is what it said. Being viewed as inferior makes a person a better servant for the watchtower. I'm appalled by this, but I'm just reading it. This is a Jehovah Witness organization that's actually saying that if you can get African American people to believe that they are inferior and that they are of a cursed group, that will make them a better what servant? What is what is the part of servant? Servant comes from what slave? And what does a slave? What is a slave? What happens to a slave? He is exploited. This is Jehovah Witness organization. This is what they are preaching. This is what this is what this is founded on. Now let's talk a little bit about the supposed curse and what did the Golden Age say? The curse which Noah pronounced upon Canaan was the origin of the black race. When it is when Noah said, "Cursed be be Canaan, a servant of servants shall be unto his brethren." He pictured the future of the black race. There have been and are a race of servants. But now in the dawn of the 20th century, we are coming to see this matter of service in its true light and to find the real joy in serving others. There is no servant in the world as good as a good colored servant. This is some deep stuff right here. Even reading it, I'm not angry. I am so happy that I actually had some time on Sunday to tell you where to get this information because Jehovah Witness organization was targeting African-American people, teaching them that they were inferior and making them feel happy that this white-led organization was giving them a ticket to receive their superiority. In the Watchtower, February 1st, 1952, the Watchtower extolled that the servant and teachable qualities of the Jehovah Witnesses was something that they must see as a blessing. Our colored brothers have a great cause for rejoicing. Their race is meek and teachable, and from it comes a high percentage of the theocratic increase. Again, this is a quote that I actually read in the religious um, research when I was in taking my graduate course in world religion and came across this journal article. This watchtower from February 1st, 1952 on page 95. I'm telling you where to go to get the information. They literally targeted African-American people and they were actually telling their group, you need to go after this group of people because they are a part of the reason why our numbers are increasing. These inferior numb nuts, and you know, that's just me putting in my own stuff. They're teachable and they're meek. And from it is a high percentage of our theocratic increase. I'm gonna tell you where to get that again. The Watchtower, February 1st. 1952, page 95. Find out for yourself. What did Russell really teach, though? Let's get into it. What did Russell really teach about black people and white people? Was he also on that, the black people inferior and that white people are there to save them? Russell actually taught that those that were into the new world would return to the humankind's original state and original skin color and language, which the Watchtower taught was white and Hebrew. 
So Russell was on that as well. Let me talk a little bit about this particular journal, journal article in uh, the Watch Designs Watchtower in February 15th, 1904. Because I actually saw this article. When I when I read this article when I was on World Vision, I, I became almost obsessed for about a month. And I started reading up on a lot of stuff, but I was doing it on my own. Um, Ari was out of the religion, had been out of religion again. I was in graduate school. Um, and I came across this article, which for some reason, I feel like I saw it again in the 80s. But there was an article in the Watchtower that asked, that answered the question, can the Ethiopian change his skin color? This, this was first talked about in Zion's Watchtower on February 15th, 1904, it's pages 52 to 53. Why would the why would the Jehovah Witness organization be teaching that a race of people needed to change their skin color? Because they were literally going by this incorrect belief that African American people were part of this curse of Ham. Which let me just let me just invalidate that right now. If you go back to the actual scripture, there is no mention of people's skin color going brown. Now, I've actually, you know, again, this, this, isn't, this isn't just coming from the Jehovah's Witness organization. I've actually heard this by quite a few people that I've been really, like, shocked. Um, so not just Jehovah's Witnesses teach that African-American people or African people come from the curse of Ham, which is absolutely false. Um, that if you literally read that scripture... Um, it's actually talking about something that most researchers, I'm talking PhDs, um, have pointed to Vizialog, uh, I was butcher it, but uh, Vitilagio. So you know the thing that they said Michael Jackson had, but my grandfather had it. Um, it's where you get patches of white skin. And this happens to people from all different racial backgrounds, including white people. Um, and so it's a skin disease which affects melanin or lack of melanin and you get patches. Um, so uh, again, these people were, you know, back in Noah's time, but they, they felt that because this person had um, this patches of skin that were a different color, that um, this led to him having unseemly conduct or the conduct in him having these patches meant that, you know, there was a connection which is absolutely not the truth. So Ethiopians did not come from Ham. Um, but let's get back to this. Can the Ethiopian change the skin color? Because the whole witnesses believe that people having brown skin was a curse. Um, so in this Zion Watchtower, they basically said that um, the difference between the races of men has long been arguments against the solidarity of the human race. Um, but the Jehovah Witnesses believe that in the new world that, um, and I'm gonna read this directly, that the Jehovah Witnesses believe that the black race would need to become white because they descended from Ham and that they would need to become white in order to um, overcome this special derogation that was given to them. So in all of Jehovah's Witnesses, um, all of the stuff that they wrote is that yes, the that when you are in the new world order, that you would you would actually be able to change your skin color and that you would be able to rise above the curse. Um, and you would, you, you would go back to the original, the original white race. So, um, the ultimate solution to racism, the Watchtower taught would be that for all the races to become equal is to all races to become white. Um, I want to talk about another, another article that said that the clash between 
the, the colored races is a growing feeling of resentment that is now in the minds of thousands of educated blacks, browns, and yellows over the, over the boasted superiority of the white race. So again, you know, I, 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 I implore other groups of people to do a research and talk about how the Jehovah Witnesses have impacted your community by miseducating you with racial propaganda. I'm just talking about it a little bit because I want people to realize what a detriment it has been to the organization. So now I'm under, <clears throat> and to the people, Jehovah Witnesses community. So now I'm, I'm talking, um, I'm under the heading, have the old shape teachings and practices really changed. So, you know, if I, you know, again, I've been around Jehovah Witnesses all my life. I've checked them on so many things. And in my new life video, I'm, I talk about how Jehovah Witnesses sized up any of the things you say when you talk about the foundation of this organization and where all this incorrect, you know, stuff that was taught. So, you know, I can sit here, I could talk to my uncle who I think as a circuit overseer now or presiding overseer. And he would probably just, there's nothing you can really do when you give people facts. But what they would do is, and this is why I always say that the new light is particularly in seminary because it is dangerous in that it can, it's a get out of jail free card. You can tell Jehovah Witnesses that there's so much racism and there's so much negative things that have been taught about African-American people and the foundations of the Jehovah Witness organization. And all they will tell you is that that's what was in the past. Yes, we, we, we made some mistakes, but now we have new life. But I, I'm here to say that it's not much has changed. It's just like in the United States. People, African-American people still, you know, are experiencing discrimination. It's, it's, it's not the same, but it still goes on. That doesn't mean that just because things have changed that the foundations of this country is so dramatically different. If there are places, and this is just, is just to give you an example. Um, my father moved out to Georgia, and I've talked about the hypocrisy of the organization. Um, my father moved out to Georgia, and he um, he lives outside of Atlanta. He lives outside of Atlanta, where it's majority white people in the in the uh, surrounding area, and so they're going to all these different these different places to preach. Um, and my father goes up to an area where a man comes out with a shotgun. And this is one of the last times I talked to my father. Um, and he told me that black people are not allowed in this Georgia town and I don't want you to get shot. So you need to get out of here, boy, before the sun goes down. So the place in Georgia is not so, like if there's places in Mississippi where there is a clear line of demarcation where African-American people can live and where they can go to school. And anybody from Alabama, from, from Mississippi, from Georgia, uh, from Louisiana, they can all tell you that there are still towns, entire towns where you better not go if you're not, if you're, if you're not white. You better not go there because the, the townspeople have made it so that they don't want African-American people living in those towns. And again, like I said, I'm not attacking self-segregation. I'm attacked, because that's natural. People like to be around people that they're around. My problem is when you start to attack people, threaten people, or you start trying to do things to harm people. So if in society, even though we have come so far, we had a, a person of African descent that was a president, there are still places in the United States that African-American people are not welcome to live. African-American people are still shot for um, a, lot of, a lot of reasons that are not fair. So if in the United States that an, uh, a white American that has 
uh, a high school diploma can make the same generally as an African American that has a master's degree, then you can still see that the foundation of this country is still very much a part of the teaching. And so I say that the segue into the covert ways in which the doctrine that this Watchtower Track and Bible Society was founded on and all of their races can the Ethiopian change their skin is still a part of the atmosphere in the Jehovah Witness organization. I'm going to talk about some of the things that I know people that I've talked to have experienced and things that I've seen. So what is what have what has the practices really been? So before I get into that, I want to talk about um, some of when African American people started calling the Jehovah Witness organization out to task. Um, and I talked about Samuel Hurd being a token. And what what is what do I mean when I say token for people that are outside of the you know African American community? What does that mean? So that means that tokenism is what the system of white supremacy has done in many cases when you know there was the NAACP and there was a government trying to implement rules to make sure that there was inclusion and diversity. Tokenism does not just apply to African Americans. Diversity also can mean women. So again, if you look at the studies on affirmative action, the biggest beneficiaries of affirmative action was white women. So affirmative action was really trying to get people and companies and corporations to have more diversity. So what did a lot of companies do? They created quotas, which is illegal, which I don't agree with, or tokens. So they're like, well, you want us to be more diverse, we'll hire one person that is of this so that you can shut up and leave us alone. So they're not changing the system, they're just putting in a token so that you can leave them alone. So again, Samuel Hurd is a token because the Jehovah Witnesses were being attacked behind the scenes because they had such a high racial makeup of African Americans and non-white Hispanics but literally the leadership was white. Now, if you talk to rank and file people, they really probably didn't know that there were so many letters and so many things that were going on internally from people that were like, this organization has a high amount of African Americans. Why are there no African Americans in your leadership? And again, let's go back a few conversations when I was, not a few conversations, but a a few minutes ago when I said they literally went after African Americans to boost their numbers, but they, they looked at African Americans, they looked at us as being meek and teachable and to be used to bolster their numbers in the United States. They had no interest in giving African Americans any type of leadership positions. But as, United, as in the United States, when African Americans were becoming more educated, when the historically black colleges and universities, African Americans, as they continued to move up and get more freedoms and have more access, they were also doing that in the Jehovah Witness organization. Why are there so many congregations that are all African American, all uh, Afro-Hispanic and mixed Hispanic, yet we see none of that in the leadership of the Jehovah Witnesses. So Cohen, another person that I talked about, um, one study, and this was done in the 1950s, and I'm going to read this verbatim. While about one half of the membership of the Witnesses in Negro, the leadership is, also, is almost completely white. When I visited the national headquarters in Brooklyn in 1952, I was told that there were only two Negroes in the head, headquarters staff of over 400. One Negro worked in the mailing room and the other was a len, len, lenotypist. The national organization worked at editing, the writing, the supervision of all various departments were exclusive to the provinces of the white members. 
and the Watchtower official report of their international convention, not one African American is identified as having a position of oversight at the convention. So again, other people outside of Jehovah's Witnesses are paying attention even in international conventions. There's no people of African descent. So that's how come when you see Samuel Heard being the token that they're making sure that you see, just know that he's the token. He's the person that they're saying, they're making sure he gets the spotlight, they're making sure he gets the PR because they know that people are gonna question. Like he's a fall guy for a lot of stuff too. A lot of controversial things that they're doing, they put on the token, but that's that's for another day. Um, even in the 1963, um, the Watchtower actually started publishing some of the direct responses to people that were questioning why, um, you know, why, why are there no African Americans in the governing body? So if anybody's interested, this is from Watchtower Society 1973. Um, a person said, um, and this is their answer. The answer to your question regarding Blacks on the Watchtower Society's directors is no. Membership in the corporation is not determined on the basis of race. Selecting of men to handle unusual responsibilities is on the basis of spiritual qualifications and not on the basis of racial um, or national points. <clears throat> Um, and this is in accord with what we read at Acts. But again, do, do most African Americans realize that there was a lot of controversy, a lot of people that were questioning why there was such a high percentage of African Americans that were members in the United States of the Jehovah's Witness organization, but it was not reflected in the Af in the leadership of the Washington Tract Society, so much so that they actually had to start responding to the comments. Um, now, I want to talk a little bit about um, Free Freeway. Um, now, I'm butchering his name, but it's Farifo Carr. Um, when he wrote the journal article, A History of Jehovah's Witnesses from a Black American Perspective, and he says that I can tell you that Blacks are still second-class citizens and the Watchtower movement, regardless of what other people say. Um, one very um, recently had ventured into places such as the circuit and um, district overseers um, and looked at how the management was done. So looking at what was going on even when they allowed African Americans to have the circuit or district overseer. However, they would completely not allow any African American that had made it up the circuit or district overseer to have anything in Southern territories. Also, and this was, this was done in uh, the late 1990s, um, from the representative standpoint, the governing body lacks Asian, Hispanic, and Black Americans. So it's still a very good boy, watchtower, white establishment. Um, one of the subtle reasons behind the watchtower's reluctance to use quote unquote minorities, and I'll explain why I don't like that um, terminology, um, is the belief that only Caucasians of Northern European American descent has the capacity to serve in these high, high roles. Um, again, this is not something that they're saying, you know, outright, it's kind of behind the lines. So it was very important for them to allow Samuel Hurd to get his position. But before I go on to the third part of my, my presentation today, thank you for listening to it. Um, what, are, what are some of the other things that I have found out about when it comes to 
the African American experience and the Jehovah Witness organization. So let's go back to the, the things that I've talked about from the, a few journal articles that I cited and the overwhelming idea that the Jehovah Witnesses were giving African people a chance to elevate themselves and that they were teaching them that they are meek and that they should be happy that they are being allowed to be a part of this brotherhood because when the new world order comes or the new world comes that they'll be able to change their black skin or their brown skin into white skin and that they will be able to alleviate the curse. Now that's a theoretical, but let me talk about it from the way that I've lived my life, the people that I've talked to and what I have observed. What is, what are, what is my background to even make these, these conclusions before I move on to my personal experiences a little bit more? Um, I'm, I'm actually studied. I'm actually educated. I've actually written things on this subject. But more importantly, I have actually lived. So do I see that mentality when I talk to Jehovah Witnesses, when I observe Jehovah Witnesses that have moved up the ranks? Do I still see the mindset of the Ethiopian that needs to change their skin color? Or do I see the subservient, meek idea, ideological, uh, I, ideological ideas behind some of the African Americans that I have been involved in and have talked to and have been honest. And yes, I have. So um, there, there's, there's a Bethelite, and I'm gonna let people do their research, who went to Bethel, African American gentleman, and he was really surprised when he talked to different people that were high ranking at Bethel that kept telling him to find a partner that was non-African American and that this would help him. I remember talking to an African American female. This was like right around the time that I was gonna leave the religion and knew I was gonna leave the religion. And I remember her talking about um, wanting to go to Bethel and wanting to marry a Bethelite. And one of the things that she said was, and she, she, we lived in an African-American community. Um, and she said, I want, I want to go to Bethel and I want to marry me a white man because it's so beautiful when you go to African-American, to, um, to Bethel and see all the interracial relationships. And so I looked at her like, well, why? I mean, what does that, like, what does it translate that for me? Because I'm confused. And she was like, because that means that we can elevate ourselves. So I was like, oh, so let me get this straight. So you think that when African-American people get white people to accept them, that they're actually elevating themselves? Or do you think it's actually helping the African-American community as a whole? And she didn't have anything to say outside of that because to me, if you if you believe that, and this is not a this is not a ding to interracial relationships. This is a ding to the motivation that the only way that you can elevate yourself as a person of African descent is to be with someone that is white because you believe that you are inferior. Then that's the thing that I'm criticizing. That's that's the mindset of what I know goes on in the Jehovah Witness organization. If integration, if telling people that are non-white that the only way for you to elevate your existence is to be around somebody that is white or encouraging African-American people or people of African descent to not date people in their own community because they need to elevate themselves. And I'm calling that out. Because that is another tactic that the Jehovah Witness organization has covertly used to make African American people feel inferior. And I've seen it when I, like I said, when I answer this question, and again, I have always been interested in Brazil. Brazil has never had anti misogynistic um, laws, but if you talk to people in Brazil who have been freely able to marry, 
unlike the United States, who had laws in place so that African Americans and whites could not marry, ask them if marrying interracially has helped the plight of the African people in Brazil. It's not. <laughs> so I feel like if the Jehovah Witness foundational teaching is that you are actually going to be relieved of your curse, which is your ethnicity, which is your supposed inferiority by standing with this, this organization who teaches that you are of a cursed group. And if you want to live now, some of the ways that you can help alleviate your curse is actually procreating or marrying someone of a superior race. And I'm saying you're drinking the Kool-Aid of a racist organization, whether you realize it or not. And I just see what that does to people. Like my grandfather and grandmother were African-American and Afro-Hispanic people. Okay, so I also have a, a bit of Afro-Hispanic in my background as well. However, my grandfather was subservient so much to this organization and a lot of African-American people like my grandfather who weren't very educated. Now compare my grandfather who didn't have a lot of education. So when he went to elder school and they revealed some secret stuff in the 1960s and 70s, that black people were really from the curse of Ham. Um, you know, he didn't have a lot of education. Now compare that to my stepfather's father who lived in Ghana and who had a PhD in African American studies. You're not gonna be able to throw that at him. You know what I'm saying? They would not even you know, they wouldn't even they wouldn't even enable that conversation. So the more miseducation you have, the more that they're able to control you. So now I'm kind of getting into my third point, which is my own personal observation and experiences. Growing up as an African-American person, I, I, I'm not gonna bash Jehovah's Witnesses 100%. I lived in areas where there was predominantly African-American, but I also, um, cause I, you know, if you wanna hear my whole story, I bounced around between fam family members and eventually moved back and live with my grandparents my last two years of high school. But my mother and my stepfather moved out of the city we lived in and lived in a, in a suburbs. And the suburbs was 98% white, 60% Jewish. And the, the congregation that my mother went to was 98% white. There was one black woman there that was married to a white man, but everybody else was white. My mother, um, because her father was presiding overseer, had this air of superiority. But because my mother had never been in an environment that was not a majority African-American, like the congregations we went to when we lived in the city were majority African-American, and when I say majority, I mean almost like 99% African-American. There may have been one Hispanic family in each of the congregations. Hispanics actually had their own congregations and they just spoke Spanish. So um, this was the environment that my mother came from, this environment that we came from. And so when my mom went to this all white congregation she had this idea that she was going to go in there and that people were going to treat her the same way because we were all under the umbrella of Jehovah's Witnesses. Just like when we moved into the area and my mom thought because she could, my mom and my stepfather thought because they could afford to live in this community that was all white, that they were going to be embraced. Now, when we first moved into the area, so I'm going to do a comparison of the Jehovah's Witness organization and the comparison to what happened when we moved into the area. When we moved into this all-white area, that's still to this day 98% white. Um, I actually did just a curious looking at it. Um, the first week that we were there, somebody spray painted on our house, get out of here, nig. Um, they didn't have room to say anything else. Um, the next week, I remember my mom and I going to the mall and somebody cut, um, had, had um, 
put a dead possum on the car. The It was much more convert where we were in the Jehovah's Witness organization. When we first came there, we were love bomb. Everybody was so nice to us when we first came. We were invited to people houses. People were having parties. But after that, it was not the same. My mother and us being kids, um, it was interesting to me. I didn't realize how stereotypical um, white kids were. They asked me, can you dance like Michael Jackson? Uh, do you, you know, like, do you know so-and-so? I'm like, are you serious right now? <laughs> but again, we were um, very educated African-American students. I mean, kids, we had went to, like I said, the top school is still the top school in the state that we go to. When they do a ranking of high schools and schools in the United States, the school that my brother and I attended are always included in that number. So we were actually probably atypical to the stereotypes that they had been used to. So when they came and asked us questions, my brother and I looked at each other like, I have no idea what you're talking about. Like, why would you think that the only the only references that these people had to African Americans was what they saw on television? They didn't know that the African American experience and culture is very diverse, and we are very you know very people. We're very multifaceted people, depending on the region that we're a part of, depending on the subcultures that we're a part of depending on the class that we're raised in, depending on the educational level of our family, the military background of our family, we're all gonna have you know, different experiences. So you really, to box people in, or even to black and white, the African-American community is a mistake. Um, so, you know, it was really interesting for us, but I think David, my brother and I were much more, um, easier to talk to all different types of people um, even because the school we went to was very diverse so we we didn't have the ears of superiority or the preconceived idea that we needed to fit in with anyone and i think we just were just just cool kids you know just talk to people so i my brother and i never really had the issues that my mother and my stepfather had when they went to this all white congregation, they had a mindset that they were going to teach these people how to be cool. And they ran into a lot of issues, a lot of racial issues. Because listen, not every white Jehovah Witness is going to be 100% comfortable talking to you or being around you. Um, and, and that's just the reality of it. My mother, having her own mental issues that I've talked about in some other videos and my stepfather as well, really didn't know how to conduct themselves. Um, and I've heard, you know, again, having talked to people, especially after leaving the organization and talking to people from different racial and ethnic backgrounds and hearing their experiences when they've gone to congregations that have not reflected their own personal ethnicity or their own personal um, community and the differences that was reflected, um, they, they definitely had to deal with it. And then going to Bethel, um, the one Bethelite um, who you can research for yourself talks about when he was sitting at a table with a governing body person and he called him the N-word. I mean, what do you do when the governing body basically calls you a racial epithet? And, and again, if you look at the, the age group of the people in the governing body outside of Samuel Hurd, you'll see a lot of people that are very, very old and have lived through a lot of the changes in society, but a lot of them still carry these same racial beliefs that you are an inferior race, that they're doing you a favor by allowing you to be a part of this organization. The subservient nature of a lot of African Americans that I've seen in positions in the Jehovah Witnesses, I think is, is an impediment to them being able to rise above it and think for themselves. One, and I think it's more of a psychological thing. If you get people to feel that they're uniquely inferior, I think it depowers them. 
it stops them from actually reaching their full potential and, and fighting against these types of things. I have seen that in my own family. I have interviewed people, um, and I've been doing these interviews on and off, which is why I'm actually able to do this video today, um, talking to people who are, I'm gonna protect their anonymity, who have told me about what it was like being an African-American in Bethel. Some of it was good, some of it wasn't so good. I appreciate listening to the videos where people talk about their experiences, but I noticed that a lot of times race is one of those subjects that they only tap dance around. And so I don't think, I don't think it's appropriate. I think you actually need to talk about it. I think you need to be honest about the racial issues that you experience. Now, there have been a few African-American Bethelites. I did listen to one Hispanic Bethelite who was very honest about the racial discrimination that they actually felt. And I mean, it's, it's honest. Because if I'm reading the, the history of this, of this organization and how it actually treated African-Americans, um, in, the, in the dialogue and the ideology behind it, I think it's very important to sort of set the stage for now, talk about my experiences. Now, what am I really hitting at? Let's go back to my actual topic. I, I, my conclusion is that the Jehovah Witness organization has, um, you know, failed the African-American community. And I, I stand by that 100%. And why, why do I say that? Because even though when the Jehovah Witnesses were going after African-American people and giving them this equal status, that they actually, not only did they not give them an equal status, not only did they bring them into an organization that was tainted in itself, okay? You actually created a lot of pathologies in the African-American community that was specifically Jehovah Witness that I am going to challenge, they would not be facing today. And I'm also going to talk about my own personal experience there. So what are the five basic areas that I am saying that the Jehovah Witness organization has failed the African-American community in? The first is education. The second is jobs. The third is retirement planning. The fourth is breaking up families and breaking up the cohesion of families. And five is the false sense of racial equality. Let's talk about education. One of the last things that it talks about in this journal article is that the educational level is now marked higher for African-American Jehovah Witnesses compared to white Americans. The most extensive survey found that only 67% of white Jehovah Witnesses are high school graduates, and a mere 4.4% are uh, graduates of college. In contrast, 82.6% of Jehovah Witnesses are high school graduates, and fully 7.6% are college graduates. Yet, 7.6% is not a lot. But yet, even with the 7.6% of African Americans that are college graduates that are in the African American community and that are Jehovah Witnesses, how many of them are leadership roles? Now, I grew up with this Jehovah Witness. I grew up as a Jehovah Witness. I left when I was 17 years old. I was able to go to undergrad, graduate school, and have several graduate certificates. I actually am in the 1% earning in the United States of America, as is my husband. We are what you call high achieving, highly educated African American people. I can tell you all of the African-American students, all of the African-American people that were my peers that I was in the Kingdom Hall with, I am the highest achieving of all of them. Why is that? 
It's not because I think I'm superior. I don't think there's anything superior about me. I'm a very humble person. The only thing I did differently was that I broke away from the African-American community. There were a lot of people that I know were brilliant. And what did they do? They went into the full-time service in the Jehovah Witness organization, which means they were non-paid workers. They were volunteers. So why do I feel that the Jehovah Witness organization has failed the African-American community when it comes to education? I feel that it has failed the African-American community when it comes to education by dissuading African-Americans to get a higher education. Because for the African-American community, every study shows that in order to elevate your socioeconomic status, you need to have some type of training behind you. Doesn't have to necessarily be college, but you need to go out, number one, you need to work. So it's not just education, so we're doing one and two together because you failed African-Americans with jobs. You failed African-American with jobs. I can talk about how my grandmothers devoted their entire lives to serving the Jehovah Witness organization without getting a paycheck. I talked about how my cousins and I, my cousin and I had to help give that are not Jehovah Witnesses to help pay for my grandmother's funeral. Jehovah Witnesses didn't, didn't contribute a dime. The Jehovah Witnesses do not help elderly people. They don't have a social service arm of the Jehovah Witnesses. And I think that it, it affects the, the African-American community specifically because we are still dealing with the foundations of discrimination and dis, um, just disparities in education and in funding. I talked about segregation in this education and how that has followed us even to this day. So this is totally affecting the African-American and the Jehovah Witness organization. If you tell them not to pursue an education and not to pursue a professional career, and then they go out and give all their free labor and time to an organization that does not give you retirement, that does not look out for you when you get old, that does not give you health insurance, that does not give you a 401k, is a total detriment. There are so many African-American families that I grew up with, including people in my own family, that are so devoted to this organization that are struggling in their retirement age, in their old age. They don't have anything saved up. They don't have any retirement. They didn't pursue education. They didn't pursue high jobs or didn't work at all. It was the two couples and one didn't work. So now when their time and they're still here, Armageddon hasn't happened and you're stuck. There's an African-American um, gentleman that reached out to me and I am so sorry that I have not gotten back to you. My heart goes out to you and I hope you don't mind me sharing a little bit of your story. There was an African-American gentleman that had listened to a few of my videos and had written to me. And he had told me about how he was at a crossroads. He's not the only one. There have actually been so many African-Americans that have reached out to me because I've talked about my own personal journey. And so part of me doing this video was to specifically talk about them. So this young gentleman who I'm, I'm speaking of specifically, and I will get back to you, was at a crossroads because he didn't pursue his education because he follow his parents' advice. And they were Jehovah Witnesses. They wanted him to devote his, his time to being a Jehovah Witness. So when he decided, when he was about 18 or 19 years old, that he did not want to be a Jehovah Witness, they threw him out of the house. So see, in order for you to go to college, you actually in high school need to be doing some things, you know, taking the right coursework. And, and so they threw them out. So then you're, you're kind of behind the eight ball because if you don't have a good job or you're, or you're, you know, like 
you're thrown out of your house before you can save up money. If you're 18 and 19, most people don't have enough money to live on their own. So then you got to think about the immediate, which is I got to find a place to live. I got to find a quick and dirty job so I can at least pay the bills. And then you're, you're just trying to work to stay above water. So then it becomes a situation where now this person is like, you know, in their late twenties and they're like, I'm working these low level jobs. And that's, you know, the cost of living is so high. And my family has cut me off. And I've seen people that went to college that were actually able to do something for themselves and have family supporting them. And I don't have that. And I'm mad as hell. I'm frustrated because I feel like my family dropped me because they were in an organization that told them that not only do I have to follow this organization, but they will not support me getting a higher education. I've heard that so many times that it's not even funny. But this one particular person, because this 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 is about how this organization is so destructive to the Jehovah Witness, to the Jehovah Witnesses that are African American, because we already have the historical background, and then you have the parents that you know said we're gonna join this Jehovah Witness organization because they treat us equal and they respect us, and then you're still being mistreated. Number four is very important. Um, I, don't, I don't know if people have been watching the news lately, but in New York, a lot of sexual abuse is being brought to the forefront and the governing body is actually being called to task for enforcing the two witness rule, for not um, informing congregations that there is a, a child um, predator in their midst, that someone that is a pedophile is in their midst. I talked about my grandfather being a presiding overseer and a pedophile. Um, and I talked about my grandmother, how I had to learn to forgive her because a lot of things that my grandmothers did, a lot of things that my mother did that harmed my family was because of what they were taught in the Jehovah's Witness organization. And let me tell you, Sexual abuse in the African-American community is not new. The sanctioning of sexual abuse in the African-American community is not new. It is not specific to the Jehovah's Witness organization, but the specifics of the two witness rule, the specifics of telling African-American members in the Jehovah's Witness organization to not turn their husbands into the police is specific to the Jehovah's Witness organization. I 100% believe that if my grandmother had not been a Jehovah's Witness, that she would have left my grandfather and she would have had a different existence. She was conditioned by this organization and it was to her detriment. When you look at African-American communities and throughout the United States, Socially, they are a very close and tight-knit community. What's significant about African Americans that are Jehovah Witnesses is that you see a lot of broken families. You see a lot of people that don't talk to each other, that haven't talked to each other, that haven't met their nieces and their nephews and their grandchildren because of this disgusting shunning. When I talk to people that are African-American, I'm African-American, I talk to people that are African-American, Afro-Hispanic, and we talk about the fact that I don't talk to the majority of my family. And the person that said, yeah, Jehovah's Witness, the Jehovah's Witnesses are crazy. Like, how can you be a, a black American and not talk to your family? Like, how does that work? So that's my number four, breaking up families and cohesiveness that is, is a, a typical excuse me, to my community. It is not typical. Uh, African-American people like are very social. We like families. We like, you know, generations of us getting together. There's a whole uh, Black family union. That's a big thing. When I was growing up, even though my family was Jehovah Witness, we had Sunday dinners where my, grand, my grandparents were African-Americans from the South, and we always had Sunday dinners. We had big Sunday breakfasts. And those things don't exist anymore. 
it's not being carried out in any tradition in my family because half of the African-American members of my family that decided not to be Jehovah Witnesses are shunned. So there's no, there's no family get together. Sometimes my cousin and I will get together. Um, once in a while I'll hear from another family member um, that is a Jehovah Witness, but just wants to see how I'm doing. But we are not cohesive. And I've actually had conversations with African Americans that are Jehovah Witnesses. And they tell me when you go to the Kingdom Halls, you'll see families don't talk to each other, haven't talked to each other. And they make these false, you know, attributions about the end is near, people are falling off. No, you are part of an organization that has broken up your family. You know, that's all, that's what it is. And it has not helped you. Um, number five, false sense of racial inequality, uh, false sense of racial equality. Um, I don't believe in a religion that teaches that I'm a, a part of a cursed group. Number one is not true. But secondly, um, I don't believe in that. And I don't think that that's a sign of a true religion. A true religion is going to be true no matter what. And no religion that I'm going to be a part of is going to teach that in order for me to elevate myself, that I actually need to change my skin color. No religion that is a, a true representation of a of a in ex, you know a being that is not held on to any of these thinkings of men is going to encourage people to to procreate with people of another race in order to elevate themselves. A true religion that is about love will teach at the very basic nature to love yourself. And if a, if a group doesn't teach that, I don't want to hear it. So there is no way that this organization is helping people with racial equality because it's a false sense of racial equality. If what they're teaching you when you go to Bethel as an African-American, as an African-American man or woman, is that you actually need to marry someone that is white in order to elevate yourself, then this is not a good group. There's nothing wrong with people marrying of different backgrounds, but there's nothing wrong with people marrying the same background either. As, as long as you believe that you are fine, no matter who you are or who you choose to have your family with, then I'm good. But as soon as you start talking racial propaganda, I'm not listening to you. I'm actually not miseducated. I'm actually not someone who is afraid to go out and find out for myself. So it's a false sense of, of racial equality. Because a lot of times the people that are African American, and I'm actually, again, I interviewed people who were very honest. They felt compelled to be subservient to the white members of Bethel that they were around. They actually felt like they had to be subservient to them to actually act like, almost like kiss my ring you know, because you as an African-American, we're doing you a favor by letting you be in our midst. And again, this has been something that's been talked about. And again, I'll, I'll leave, um, leave some of this information, but um, the history of African-Americans from a Black American perspective, Blacks in the Watchtower by Michael Jones. Um, where's the other one that I wanted to make sure? Jehovah Witnesses and Racial Prejudice by Warner Cohen. Please read those things. And, you know, again, this is just me kind of taking the time on my Sunday morning when I knew I had some time to kind of hit, hit in a lot of ways um, that I really felt was important. So how, what, what is my purpose? You know, I want to wake people up. I want to wake the African-American community up and stop allowing this apocalyptic publishing and real estate empire to exploit you. Um, I, I, you know, again, my family's African-American. They are so devoted to this organization till it's almost like, you don't want to waste your time talking to them. The few people that I, that they wait, that, you know, come to me and say, I know what you're saying is true. It's just that I'm too far, too deep in it. That's fine. As long as in yourself, you're waking up and realizing that you've been lied to your whole life. 
Like people have been telling you things to condition you so that they can exploit your work. You're sitting there, you're not working, you're not getting an education, you're devoting yourself loyally to a group that hides pedophiles. Like, you know, like I told people, what a mind, you know what, when 400 people went to my grandfather's funeral, and then I find out that my grandfather was a pedophile who had raped my mom and my aunts. You know what I'm saying? And they hid that. They hid that from grandkids because they were being indoctrinated by this organization. And my grand, and, and you know the detriment that it has done to my family? How many families have suffered, not just African-American families, but families in general that have suffered from this organization hiding behind their two witness rule? And, you know, forcing people not to get an education or this, it's, it's really a hypocritical not getting an education because at the one time that they don't like people getting an education, they elevate certain people once if they're not Jehovah Witnesses like my stepfather, he didn't become a Jehovah Witness until he had went and got his master's degree, had already taught, you know, at a university level. My father got his master's degree when he was a fellowship, was in the military when it's a fellowship. Now those things are things that they can actually reference and he can use again. But it's to the detriment because these are all people that were doing things to people in their families, whether it was sexual abuse, whether it was violence. And the Jehovah Witness community is telling the African-American women to accept it. When even in, in society outside of it is, is saying don't accept it. So it, it's been a detriment. So my goal, my goal is to talk to the African-American community specifically, a community that I am a part of and say, I have taken the time I have tried to share some information. My goal is to awaken people and to help them to open up to all of the things that are out there for us to be free. Freedom. Freedom is what this is all about. I thank you from the bottom of my heart for listening to my conversation with you this morning. I hope you have gotten something out of it. I know I have totally enjoyed it from start to finish. This is probably one of my most, uh, you know, one of the things that I'm most proud of doing that I've been wanting to do for a long time. So I hope that you have enjoyed this conversation and I look forward to talking with you real soon.